Prefatory Note of Folklore and Legends Oriental. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Folklore and Legends Oriental by Charles John Tibbets. Prefatory Note The East is rich in folklore, and the lorist is not troubled to discover material but to select only that which it is best worth his while to preserve. The conditions under which the people live are most favorable to the preservation of the ancient legends, and the cultivation of the powers of narration fits the Oriental to present his stories in a more polished style than is usual in the Western countries. The reader of these tales will observe many points of similarity between them and the popular fictions of the West. Similarity of thought and incident, and nothing perhaps speaks more eloquently the universal brotherhood of man than this oneness of folk fiction at the same time the tales of the east are unique lighted up as they are by a gorgeous extravagance of imagination which never fails to attract and delight end of prefatory note Section 1 of Folklore and Legends Oriental. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fano Jahangiri. Folklore Legends Oriental by Charles John Tibbets. Section 1 The Cobbler Astrologer. In the great city of Isfahan lived Ahmad the cobbler, an honest and industrious man whose wish was to pass through life quietly. But he might have done so had he not married a handsome wife who, although she had condescended to accept of him as a husband, was far from being contented with his humble sphere of life. Sitara, such was the name of Ahmed's wife, was ever forming foolish schemes of riches and grandeur, and though Ahmed never encouraged them, he was too fond a husband to quarrel with what gave her pleasure. An incredulous smile or a shake of the head was his only answer to her often told daydreams, and she continued to persuade herself that she was certainly destined to great fortune. It happened one evening, while in this temper of mind, that she went to the Himam, where she saw a lady retiring dressed in a magnificent robe covered with jewels and surrounded by slaves. This was the very condition Setara had always longed for, and she eagerly inquired the name of the happy person who had so many attendants and such fine jewels. She learned it was the wife of the chief astrologer to the king. With this information she returned home. Her husband met her at the door, but was received with a frown, nor could all his caresses obtain a smile or a word. For several hours she continued silent and in apparent misery. At length she said, Seize your caresses, unless you are ready to give me a proof that you do really and sincerely love me. What proof of love? exclaimed poor Ahmad. Can you desire which I will not give? Give over cobbling, it is a vile low trade and never yields more than ten or twelve dinars a day. Turn astrologer, your fortune will be made and I shall have all I wish, and be happy. Astrologer, cried Ahmad, astrologer, have you forgotten who I am? A cobbler, without any learning, that you want me to engage in a profession which requires so much skill and knowledge? I neither think nor care about your qualifications, said the enraged wife. All I know is that if you do not turn astrologer immediately, I will be divorced from you tomorrow. The cobbler remonstrated, but in vain. The figure of the astrologer's wife with her jewels and her slaves had taken complete possession of Setara's imagination. All night it haunted her, she dreamt of nothing else, and on awaking declared she would leave the house if her husband did not comply with her wishes. What could poor Ahmad do? He was no astrologer, but he was dotingly fond of his wife, and he could not bear the idea of losing her. He promised to obey, and having sold his little stock, bought an astrolabe, an astronomical almanac, and a table of the twelve signs of the zodiac. Furnished with these, he went to the marketplace, crying, 
I am an astrologer. I know the sun and the moon and the stars and the twelve signs of the zodiac. I can calculate nativities. I can foretell everything that is to happen. No man was better known than Ahmed the cobbler. The crowd soon gathered round him. What? Friend Ahmed? said one. Have you worked till your head is turned? Are you tired of looking down at your last? cried another. Did you are now looking up at the planets? These and a thousand other jokes assailed the ears of the poor cobbler, who, notwithstanding, continued to exclaim that he was an astrologer, having resolved on doing what he could to please his beautiful wife. It so happened that the king's jeweller was passing by. He was in great distress, having lost the richest ruby belonging to the crown. Every search had been made to recover this inestimable jewel, and to no purpose and as the jeweller knew he could no longer conceal its loss from the king he looked forward to death as inevitable in this hopeless state while wandering about the town he reached the crowd around ahmed and asked what was the matter don't you know ahmed the cobbler said one of the bystanders laughing he has been inspired and is become an astrologer a drowning man will catch at a broken reed the jeweller no sooner heard the sound of the word astrologer than he went up to ahmed told him what had happened and said if you understand your art you must be able to discover the king's ruby do so and i will give you two hundred pieces of gold but if you do not succeed within six hours i will use all my influence at court to have you put to death as an impostor poor ahmed was thunderstruck he stood long without being able to move or speak, reflecting on his misfortunes and grieving, above all, that his wife, whom he so loved, had by her envy and selfishness brought him to such a fearful alternative. Full of these sad thoughts, he exclaimed aloud, O woman, O woman, thou art more baneful to the happiness of man than the poisonous dragon of the desert. The last ruby had been secreted by the jeweller's wife, who, disquieted by those alarms which were attend guilt, sent one of her female slaves to watch her husband. This slave, on seeing her master speak to the astrologer, drew near, and when she heard Ahmed, after some moments of apparent abstraction, compare a woman to a poisonous dragon, she was satisfied that he must know everything. She ran to her mistress, and breathless with fear, cried, you are discovered my dear mistress you are discovered by a vile astrologer before six hours are past the whole story will be known and you will become infamous if you are even so fortunate as to escape with life unless you can find some way of prevailing on him to be merciful she then related what she had seen and heard and ahmed's exclamation carried as complete conviction to the mind of the terrified mistress as it had done to that of her slave the jeweller's wife, hastily throwing on her veil, went in search of the dreaded astrologer. When she found him, she threw herself at his feet, crying, Spare my honor and my life, and I will confess everything. What can you have to confess to me? exclaimed Ahmad in amazement. Oh, nothing, nothing with which you are not already acquainted. You know too well that I stole the ruby from the king's crown. I did so to punish my husband, who uses me most cruelly, and I thought by this means to obtain riches for myself and to have him put to death but you most wonderful man from whom nothing is hidden have discovered and defeated my wicked plan i i beg only for mercy and i will do whatever you command me an angel from heaven could not have brought more consolation to ahmed than did the jeweller's wife he assumed all the dignified solemnity that became his new character and said woman i know all thou hast done and it is fortunate for thee that thou hast come to confess thy sin and beg for mercy before it was too late return to thy house put the ruby under the pillow of the couch on which thy husband sleeps let it be laid on the side furthest from the door and be satisfied thy guilt shall never be even suspected the jeweller's wife returned home and did as she was desired in an hour ahmed followed her and told the jeweller he had made his calculations and found by the aspects of the sun and the moon and by the configuration of the stars that the ruby was at that moment lying under the pillow of his couch on the side furthest from the door 
The jeweller thought Ahmed must be crazy, but as a ray of hope is like a ray from heaven to the wretched, he ran to his couch, and there to his joy and wonder found the ruby in the very place described. He came back to Ahmed, embraced him, called him his dearest friend and the preserver of his life, and gave him the two hundred pieces of gold, declaring that he was the first astrologer of the age. These praises conveyed no joy to the poor cobbler, who returned home more thankful to God for his preservation than elated by his good fortune. The moment he entered the door, his wife ran up to him and exclaimed, Well, my dear astrologer, what success? There, said Ahmed very gravely, there are two hundred pieces of gold. I hope you will be satisfied now and not ask me again to hazard my life as I have done this morning. Then he related all that had passed, but the recital made a very different impression on the lady from what these occurrences had made on Ahmed. Sitara saw nothing but the gold, which would enable her to vie with the chief astrologer's wife at the hammam. Courage, said she. Courage, my dearest husband. This is only your first labor in your new and noble profession. Go on and prosper, and we shall become rich and happy. In vain Ahmed remonstrated and represented the danger. She burst into tears and accused him of not loving her, ending with her usual threat of insisting upon a divorce. Ahmed's heart melted and he agreed to make another trial. Accordingly, next morning he sallied forth with his astrolabe, his twelve signs of the zodiac and his almanac, exclaiming as before, I am an astrologer, I know the sun and the moon and the stars and the twelve signs of the zodiac, I can calculate nativities, I can foretell everything that is to happen. A crowd again gathered round him, but it was now with wonder and not ridicule, for the story of the ruby had gone abroad, and the voice of the fame had converted the poor cobbler Ahmed into the ablest and most learned astrologer that was ever seen at this farm. While everybody was gazing at him, a lady passed by veiled. She was the wife of one of the richest merchants in the city, and had just been at the hammam, where she had lost a valuable necklace and earrings. She was now returning home in great alarm, lest her husband should suspect her of having given her jewels to a lover. Seeing the crowd around Ahmed, she asked the reason of their assembling, and was informed of the whole story of the famous astrologer. How he had been a cobbler, was inspired by supernatural knowledge, and could, with the help of his astrolabe, his twelve signs of the zodiac, and his almanac, discover all that ever did or ever would happen in the world. The story of the jeweler and the king's ruby was then told her, accompanied by a thousand wonderful circumstances which had never occurred. The lady, quite satisfied of his skill, went up to Ahmed and mentioned her law, saying, A man of your knowledge and penetration will easily discover my jewels. Find them, and I will give you fifty pieces of gold. The poor cobbler was quite confounded and looked down, thinking only how to escape without the public exposure of his ignorance. The lady, in pressing through the crowd, had torn the lower part of her way. Ahmed's downcast eyes noticed this, and wishing to inform her of it in a delicate manner before it was observed by others, he whispered to her, Lady, look down at the rent. The lady's head was full of her loss, and she was at that moment endeavoring to recollect how it could have occurred. Ahmed's speech brought it at once to her mind, and she exclaimed with delighted surprise, Stay here a few moments. Thou great astrologer, I will return immediately with the reward thou so well deservest. Saying this, she left him, and soon returned carrying in one hand a necklace and earrings, and in the other a purse with the fifty pieces of gold. There is gold for thee, she said. Thou wonderful man, to whom all the secrets of nature are revealed, I had quite forgotten where I laid the jewels, and without thee should never have found them. But when thou desiredst me to look at the rents below i instantly recollected the rents near the bottom of the wall in the bathroom where before undressing i had hid them i can now go home in peace and comfort and it is all owing to thee thou wisest of men after these words she walked away and ahmed returned to his home thankful to providence for his preservation and fully resolved never again to tempt it his handsome wife however could not yet rival the chief astrologer's lady in her appearance at the hammam so she renewed her entreaties and threats to make her fond husband continue his career as an astrologer 
About this time it happened that the king's treasury was robbed of forty chests of gold and jewels, forming the greater part of the wealth of the kingdom. The high treasurer and other officers of state used all diligence to find the thieves, but in vain. The king sent for his astrologer and declared that if the robbers were not detected by a stated time, he as well as the principal ministers should be put to death. Only one day of the short period given them remained. All their search had proved fruitless, and the chief astrologer, who had made his calculations and exhausted his art to no purpose, had quite resigned himself to his fate, when one of his friends advised him to send for the wonderful cobbler, who had become so famous for his extraordinary discoveries. Two slaves were immediately dispatched for Ahmed, whom they commanded to go with them to their master. You see the effects of your ambition, said the poor cobbler to his wife. I am going to my death. The king's astrologer has heard of my presumption, and is determined to have me executed as an impostor. On entering the palace of the chief astrologer, he was surprised to see that dignified person come forward to receive him and lead him to the seat of honor, and not less so to hear himself thus addressed. The ways of heaven most learned and excellent Ahmed are unsearchable. The high are often cast down, and the low are lifted up. The whole world depends upon fate and fortune. It is my turn now to be depressed by fate. It is thine to be exalted by fortune. His speech was here interrupted by a messenger from the king, who, having heard of the cobbler's fame, desired his attendance. Poor Ahmed now concluded that it was all over with, and followed the king's messenger, praying to God that he would deliver him from this peril. When he came into the king's presence, he bent his body to the ground and wished his majesty long life and prosperity. "'Tell me, Ahmed,' said the king, "'who has stolen my treasure?' "'It was not one man,' answered Ahmed, after some consideration. "'There were forty thieves concerned in the robbery.' "'Very well,' said the king. "'But who were they? And what have they done with my gold and jewels?' "'These questions,' said Ahmed, "'I cannot now answer but i hope to satisfy your majesty if you will grant me forty days to make my calculations i grant you forty days said the king but when they are past if my treasure is not found your life shall pay the forfeit ahmed returned to his house but please for he resolved to take advantage of the time allowed him to fly from a city where his fame was likely to be his ruin well ahmed said his wife as she entered what news at court no news at all said he except that i am to be put to death at the end of forty days unless i find forty chests of gold and jewels which have been stolen from the royal treasury but you will discover the thieves how but what means am i to find them by the same art which discovered the ruby and the lady's necklace the same art replied ahmed foolish woman thou knowest that i have no art and that i have only pretended to it for the sake of pleasing thee but i have had sufficient skill to gain forty days during which time we may easily escape to some other city and with the money i now possess and the aid of my former occupation we may still obtain an honest livelihood an honest livelihood repeated his lady with scorn with thy cobbling thou mean spritless wretch ever enabled me to go to the hammam like the wife of the chief astrologer hear me ahmed think only of discovering the king's treasure thou hast just as good a chance of doing so as thou hadst of finding the ruby and the necklace and earrings at all events i am determined thou shalt not escape and shouldst thou attempt to run away i will inform the king's officers and have thee taken up and put to death even before the forty days are expired thou knowest me too well ahmed to doubt my keeping my word so take courage and endeavour to make thy fortune and to place me in that rank of life to which my beauty entitles me the poor cobbler was dismayed at this speech but knowing there was no hope of changing his wife's resolution he resigned himself to his fate well said he your will shall be obeyed all i desire is to pass the few remaining days of my life as comfortably as i can you know i am no scholar and have little skill in reckoning so there are forty dates give me one of them every night after i have said my prayers that i may put them in a jar and by counting them may always see how many of the few days i have to live are gone the lady pleased at carrying her point took the days and promised to be punctual in doing what her husband desired 
Meanwhile, the thieves who had stolen the king's treasure, having been kept from leaving the city by fear of detection and pursuit, had received accurate information of every measure taken to discover them. One of them was among the crowd before the palace on the day the king sent for Ahmed, and hearing that the cobbler had immediately declared their exact number, he ran in a fright to his comrades and exclaimed, We are all found out. Ahmed, the new astrologer, has told the king that there are forty of us. There needed no astrologer to tell that, said the captain of the gang. This Ahmed, with all his simple good nature, is a shrewd fellow. For the chests having been stolen, he naturally guessed that there must be forty thieves, and he has made a good hit. That is all. Still, it is prudent to watch him, for he certainly has made some strange discoveries. One of us must go to-night after dark to the trace of this cobbler's house, and listen to his conversation with his handsome wife, for he is said to be very fond of her, and will no doubt tell her what success he has had in his endeavors to detect us. Everybody approved of this scheme, and soon after nightfall one of the thieves repaired to the terrace. He arrived there just as the cobbler had finished his evening prayer, and his wife was giving him the first date. Ah, oh, said Ahmed, as he took it, there is one of the forty. The thief, hearing these words, hastened in consternation to the gang, and told them that the moment he took his post he had been perceived by the supernatural knowledge of Ahmed, who immediately told his wife that one of them was there. The spy's tale was not believed by his hardened companions. Something was imputed to his fears. He might have been mistaken. In short, it was determined to send two men the next night at the same hour. They reached the house just as Ahmed, having finished his prayers, had received a second date, and heard him explain, My dear wife, tonight there are two of them. The astonished thieves fled and told their still incredulous comrades what they had heard. Three men were consequently sent the third night for the fourth, and so on. Being afraid of venturing during the day, they always came as evening closed in, and just as Ahmed was receiving his date, hence they all in turn heard him say that which convinced them he was aware of their presence. On the last night they all went, and Ahmed exclaimed aloud, the number is complete. Tonight the whole forty are here. All doubts were now removed. It was impossible that Ahmed should have discovered them by any natural means. How could he ascertain their exact number, and night after night without ever once being mistaken? He must have learned it by his skill in astrology. Even the captain now yielded in spite of his incredulity, and declared his opinion that it was hopeless to elude a man thus gifted. He therefore advised that they should make a friend of the cobbler by confessing everything to him and bribing him to secrecy by a share of the booty. His advice was approved of, and an hour before dawn they knocked at Ahmed's door. The poor man jumped out of bed, and supposing the soldiers were come to lead him to execution, cried out, Have patience! I know what you are come for. It is a very unjust and wicked deed. Most wonderful man, said the captain as the door was opened. We are fully convinced that thou knowest why we are come, nor do we mean to justify the action of which thou speakst. Here are two thousand pieces of gold which we will give thee, provided thou wilt swear to say nothing more about the matter. Say nothing about it, said Ahmed. Do you think it possible I can suffer such gross wrongs and injustice without complaining and making it known to all the world? Have mercy upon us, exclaimed the thieves falling on their knees only spare our lives and we will restore the royal treasure the cobbler started rubbed his eyes to see if he were asleep or awake and being satisfied that he was awake and that the men before him were really the thieves he assumed a solemn tone and said guilty men ye are persuaded that ye cannot escape from my penetration which reaches unto the sun and moon and knows the position and aspect of every star in the heavens your timely repentance have saved you but ye must immediately restore all that ye have stolen go straightway and carry the forty chests exactly as you found them and bury them a foot deep under the southern wall of their old ruined hammam beyond the king's palace if ye do this punctually your lives are spared but if ye fail in the slightest degree 
destruction will fall upon you and your families the thieves promised obedience to his commands and departed ahmed then fell on his knees and returned thanks to god for this signal mark of his favor about two hours after the royal guards came and desired ahmed to follow them he said he would attend them as soon as he had taken leave of his wife to whom he determined not to impart what had occurred until he saw the result he bade her farewell very affectionately she supported herself with great fortitude on this trying occasion exhorting her husband to be of good cheer and said a few words about the goodness of providence but the fact was sitara fancied that if god took the worthy cobbler to himself her beauty might attract some rich lover who would enable her to go to the hammam with as much splendor as that astrologer's lady whose image adorned with jewels and fine clothes and surrounded by slaves still haunted her imagination the decrees of heaven are just a reward suited to their merits awaited ahmed and his wife the good man stood with a cheerful countenance before the king who was impatient for his arrival and immediately said ahmed thy looks are promising hast thou discovered my treasure does your majesty require the thieves or the treasure the stars will only grant one or the other said ahmed looking at the table of astrological calculations your majesty must make your choice i can deliver up either but not both i should be sorry not to punish the thieves answered the king but if it must be so i choose a treasure and you give the thieves a full and free pardon i do provided i find my treasure untouched then said ahmed if your majesty will follow me the treasure shall be restored to you the king and all his nobles followed the cobbler to the ruins of old hammam there casting his eyes toward heaven ahmed muttered some sounds which were supposed by the spectators to be magical conjurations but which were in reality the prayers and thanksgivings of a sincere and pious heart to god for his wonderful deliverance when his prayer was finished he pointed to the southern wall and requested that his majesty would order his attendants to dig there the work was hardly begun when the whole forty chests were found in the same state as when stolen with the treasurer's seal upon them still unbroken the king's joy knew no bounds he embraced ahmed and immediately appointed him his chief astrologer assigned to him an apartment in the palace and declared that he should marry his only daughter as it was his duty to promote the man whom god had so singularly favored and had made instrumental in restoring the treasures of his kingdom the young princess who was more beautiful than the moon was not dissatisfied with her father's choice for her mind was stored with religion and virtue and she had learned to value beyond all earthly qualities that piety and learning which she believed ahmed to possess the royal will was carried into execution as soon as formed the wheel of fortune had taken a complete turn the morning had found ahmed in a wretched hovel rising from a sorry bed in the expectation of losing his life in the evening he was the lord of a rich palace and married to the only daughter of a powerful king but this change did not alter his character as he had been meek and humble in adversity he was modest and gentle in prosperity conscious of his own ignorance he continued to ascribe his good fortune solely to the favor of the providence he became daily more attached to the beautiful and virtuous princess whom he had married and he could not help contrasting her character with that of his former wife whom he had ceased to love and of whose unreasonable and unfeeling vanity he was now fully sensible end of section one recording by farnud jahangiri section two of folklore and legends oriental this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by farna jahangiri folklore and legends oriental by charles john tibbets section two the legend of the terrestrial paradise of Shaddad, the son of Ad. It is related that Abdullah 
the son of Abu Kaliba, went forth to seek a camel that had run away, and while he was proceeding over the deserts of Al Yaman and the district of Sabah, he chanced to arrive at a vast city encompassed by the enormous fortifications around the circuit of which were pavilions rising high into the sky. So when he approached it, he imagined that there must be inhabitants within it, of whom he might inquire for his camel, and accordingly he advanced, but on coming to it, he found that it was desolate, without any one to cheer its solitude. I alighted, says he, from my she-camel, and tied up her foot, and then, composing my man, entered the city. On approaching the fortifications, I found that they had two enormous gates, the like of which, for size and height, have never been seen elsewhere in the world, set with a variety of jewels and jacinths, white and red, and yellow and green, and when I behold this, I was struck with the utmost wonder at it, and the sight astonished me. I entered the fortifications in a state of terror, and with a wandering mind, and saw them to be of the same large extent as the city, and to comprise elevated pavilions, every one of these containing lofty chambers, and all of them constructed of gold and silver, and adorned with rubies and chrysolites, and pearls and various colored jewels. The folding doors of these pavilions were like those of the fortifications in beauty, and the floors were overlaid with large pearls and with balls like hazelnuts composed of musk and ambergris and saffron. And when I came into the midst of the city, I saw not in it a created being of the sons of Adam, and I almost died of terror. I then looked down from the summits of the lofty chambers and pavilions, and saw rivers running beneath them, and in the great thoroughfare streets of the city were fruit-bearing trees and tall palm trees, and the construction of the city was of alternate bricks of gold and silver. So I said within myself, no doubt this is the paradise promised in the world to come. I carried away of the jewels which were as its gravel and the musk that was as its dust as much as I could bear and returned to my district where I acquainted the people with the occurrence. And the news reached Muawiyah, the son of Abu Sufyan, who was then caliph in the Hejaz. So he wrote to his lieutenant in San'a of al Yaman, saying, Summon that man and inquire of him the truth of the matter. His lieutenant therefore caused me to be brought, and demanded of me an account of my adventure, and of what had befallen me. And I informed him of what I had seen. He then sent me to Moavie, and acquainted him also with that which I had seen. But he disbelieved it. So I produced to him some of those pearls and the little balls of ambergris and musk and saffron. The latter retained somewhat of their sweet scent, but the pearls had become yellow and discolored. At the sight of these, Moavia wondered, and he sent and caused Kabul Ahbar to be brought before him, and said to him, O Kabul Ahbar, I have called thee on account of a matter of which I desire to know the truth, and I hope that thou mayst be able to certify me of it. And what is it, O Prince of the Faithful? asked Kabul Ahbar, Moavia said. Hast thou any knowledge of the existence of a city constructed of gold and silver, the pillars whereof are of chrysolite and ruby, and the gravel of which is of pearls and of balls like hazelnuts, composed of musk and ambergris and saffron? He answered, Yes, O Prince of the Faithful, it is Iremzatel Emad, the like of which has never been constructed in the regions of the earth, and Shedad, the son of Ad the Greater, built it. Relate to us, said Moavia, somewhat of its history, and Kabul Ahbar replied, Thus. Ad the Greater had two sons, Shadid and Shadad, and when their father perished, they reigned conjointly over the countries after him, and there was no one of the kings of the earth who was not subject to them. And Shadid the son of Ad died, so his brother Shadad ruled alone over the earth after him. He was fond of reading the ancient books, and when he met with the description of the world to come, and of paradise, with its pavilions and lofty chambers and its trees and fruits and of the other things in paradise, his heart enticed him to construct its like on the earth, after this manner which had been above mentioned. He had under his authority hundred thousand kings, under each of whom were a hundred thousand valiant chieftains, and under each of these were a hundred thousand soldiers. And he summoned them all before him, and said to them, I found in the ancient books and histories the description of the paradise that is in the other world, and I desire to make its like upon the earth. Depart ye therefore to the most pleasant and most spacious vacant tract in the earth, and build for me in it a city of gold and silver, and a spread, as is gravel, chrysolite, and rubies and pearls, 
and as the support of the vaulted roofs of that city make columns of chrysolite and fill it with pavilions and over the pavilions construct lofty chambers and beneath them plant in the by streets and great thoroughfare streets varieties of trees bearing different kinds of ripe fruit and make rivers to run beneath them in channels of gold and silver to this they replied how can we accomplish that which thou hast described to us and how can we procure the chrysalis and rubies and pearls that thou hast mentioned but he said know ye not that the kings of the world are obedient to me and under my authority and that no one who is in it disobeyeth my command they answered yes we know that depart then said he to the mines of the chrysolite and ruby and to the places where pearls are found in gold and silver and take forth and collect their contents from the earth and spare no exertions take also for me from the hands of me such of those things as ye find and spare none nor let any escape you and beware of disobedience he then wrote a letter to each of the kings in the regions of the earth commanding them to collect all the articles of the kinds above mentioned that their subjects possess and to repair to the mines in which these things were found and extract the precious stones that they contained even from the beds of the seas and they collected the things that he required in the space of twenty years after which he sent forth the geometricians and sages and laborers and artificers from all the countries and regions and they dispersed themselves through the deserts and wastes and tracts and districts until they came to a desert wherein was a vast open plain clear from hills and mountains and in it were springs gushing forth and rivers running so they said this is the kind of place which the king commanded us to seek and called us to find they then busied themselves in building the city according to the direction of the king Shaddad, king of the whole earth in its length and breadth, and they made through it the channels for the rivers and laid the foundations comfortably with a prescribed extent. The kings of the various districts of the earth sent thither the jewels and stones and large and small pearls and carnelians and pure gold upon camels over the desert and wastes and sent great ships with them over the seas and the quantity of those things such as cannot be described nor calculated nor defined was brought to the workmen who labored in the construction of the city three hundred years and when they had finished it they came to the king and acquainted him with the completion and he said to them depart and make around it impregnable fortifications of great height and construct around the circuit of the fortifications a thousand pavilions each with a thousand pillars beneath it in order that there may be in each pavilion a vizier so they went immediately and did this in twenty years after which they presented themselves before shaddad and informed him of the accomplishment of his desire he therefore ordered his viziers who were a thousand in number and his chief officers and such of his troops and others as he confided in to make themselves ready for departure and to prepare themselves for removal to aram zatal emad in attendance upon the king of the world shaddad the son of ad he ordered also such as he chose of his women and his harem as his female slaves and his eunuchs to feed themselves out and they passed twenty years in equipping themselves then shaddad proceeded with his troops rejoined at the accomplishment of the, his desire until there remained between him and aram zatal emad one day's journey when god sent down upon him and upon the obstinate in the fiddles who accompanied him a loud cry from the heaven of his power and he destroyed them all by the vehemence of his sound neither shaddad nor any of those who were with him arrived at the city or came in sight of it and god obliterated and the traces of the road that led to it but the city remaineth as it was in its place until the hour of the judgment at this narrative related by kabul ahbar muawiyah wondered and he said to him can any one of mankind arrive at that city yes answered kabul ahbar a man of the companions of muhammad upon whom be blessing and peace in appearance like this man who is sitting here without any doubt a shabi also saith it is related on the authority of the learned men of Hemyar in el yemen that when shaddad and those who were with him were destroyed by the loud cry his son shaddad the less reigned after him for his father shaddad the greater had left him as a successor to his kingdom in the land of Handromat and saba on his departure with the troops who accompanied him to aram zatal emad and as soon as the news reached him of the death of his father on the way before his arrival at the city of arim 
he gave orders to carry his father's body from those desert tracks to hadromat and to excavate the sepulchre for him in a cavern and when they had done this he placed his body in it upon a couch of gold and covered the corpse with seventy robes interwoven with gold and adorned with precious jewels and he placed at his head a tablet of gold whereon were inscribed these verses be admonished o thou who art deceived by a prolonged life i am shaddad the son of ad the lord of a strong fortress the lord of power and might and of excessive valor and inhabitants of the earth obeyed me fearing my severity and threats and i held the east and west under a strong dominion and a preacher of their true religion invited us to the right way but we opposed him and said is there no refuge from it and a loud cry assaulted us from a tract of the distant horizon whereupon we fell down like corn in the midst of a plain at harvest and now beneath the earth we await the threatened day as ali b also says it happened that two men entered this cavern and found at its upper end some steps and having descended these they found an excavation the length whereof was a hundred cubits and its breadth forty cubits and its height a hundred cubits and in the midst of this excavation was a couch of gold upon which was a man of enormous bulk occupying its whole length and breadth covered with ornaments and with robes interwoven with gold and silver and at his head was a tablet of gold whereon was an inscription and they took that tablet and carried away from the place as much as they could of bars of gold and silver and other things end of section two recording by final jahangiri section three of folklore and legends oriental this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Folklore and Legends Oriental by Charles John Tibbets. The Tomb of Nusherwan. The Caliph Harun ur Rashid went to visit the tomb of the celebrated nushawan the most famous of all the monarchs who ever governed persia before the tomb was a curtain of gold cloth which when harun touched it fell to pieces the walls of the tomb were covered with gold and jewels whose splendor illumined its darkness the body was placed in a sitting posture on a throne encased with jewels and had so much the appearance of life that on the first impulse the commander of the faithful bent to the ground and saluted the remains of the just nusherwan though the face of the departed monarch was like that of a living man and the whole of the body in a state of preservation which showed the admirable skill of those who embalmed it yet when the caliph touched the garments they mouldered into dust Harun, upon this, took his own rich robes and threw them over the corpse. He also hung up a new curtain, richer than that he had destroyed, and perfumed the whole tomb with camphor and other sweet scents. It was remarkable that no change was perceptible in the body of Nusherwan, except that the ears had become white. The whole scene affected the caliph greatly. He burst into tears and repeated from the Koran, what I have seen is a warning to those who have eyes. He observed some writing upon the throne, which he ordered the Mubids, priests, who were learned in the Pelevi language, to read and explain. They did so. It was as follows. This world remains not. The man who thinks least of it is the wisest. Enjoy this world before thou becomest its prey. Bestow the same favor on those below thee as thou desirest to receive from those above thee. If thou shouldst conquer the whole world, death will at last conquer thee. Be careful that thou art not the dupe of thine own fortune. Thou shalt be paid exactly for what thou hast done, no more, no less. 
the caliph observed a dark ruby ring on the finger of nushawan on which was written avoid cruelty study good and never be precipitate in action if thou shouldst live for a hundred years never for one moment forget death value above all things the society of the wise around the right arm of nushirwan was a clasp of gold on which was engraved on a certain year on the tenth day of the month erdebesht a caliph of the race of adian professing the faith of mohammed accompanied by four good men and one bad shall visit my tomb below this sentence were the names of the forefathers of the caliph another prophecy was added concerning Harun's pilgrimage to Nushirwan's tomb. This prince will honor me, and do good unto me, though I have no claim upon him, and he will clothe me in a new vest, and besprinkle my tomb with sweet-scented essences, and then depart unto his home. But the bad man who accompanies him shall act treacherously towards me. I pray that God may send one of my race to repay the great favors of the caliph, and to take vengeance on his unworthy companion. There is, under my throne, an inscription which the caliph must read and contemplate. Its contents will remind him of me, and make him pardon my inability to give him more. The caliph, on hearing this, put his hand under the throne and found the inscription, which consisted of some lines inscribed on a ruby as large as the palm of the hand. The Mubids read this also. It contained information where would be found concealed a treasure of gold and arms, with some caskets of rich jewels. Under this was written, These I give to the Caliph in return for the good he has done me. Let him take them and be happy. When Harun ur Rashid was about to leave the tomb, Hussein ben Sahil, his vizier, said to him, O Lord of the Faithful, what is the use of all these precious gems which ornament the abode of the dead and are of no benefit to the living allow me to take some of them the caliph replied with indignation such a wish is more worthy of a thief than of a great or wise man hussein was ashamed of his speech and said to the servant who had been placed at the entrance of the tomb go thou and worship the holy shrine within the man went into the tomb. He was above a hundred years old, but he had never seen such a blaze of wealth. He felt inclined to plunder some of it, but was at first afraid. At last, summoning all his courage, he took a ring from the finger of Nushirwan and came away. Rune saw this man come out, and observing him alarmed, he at once conjectured what he had been doing. Addressing those around him, he said, Do not you now see the extent of the knowledge of Nushirwan? He prophesied that there should be one unworthy man with me. It is this fellow. What have you taken? said he in an angry tone. Nothing, said the man. Search him, said the caliph. It was done, and the ring of Nushirwan was found. This the caliph immediately took, and entering the tomb, replaced it on the cold finger of the deceased monarch. When he returned, a terrible sound like that of loud thunder was heard. Harun came down from the mountain on which the tomb stood and ordered the road to be made inaccessible to future curiosity. He searched for and found in the place described the gold, the arms, and the jewels bequeathed to him by Nushirwan and sent them to Baghdad. Among the rich articles found was a golden crown, which had five sides, and was richly ornamented with precious stones. On every side a number of admirable lessons were written. The most remarkable were as follows. First side. Give my regards to those who know themselves. Consider the end before you begin, and before you advance, provide a retreat. Give not unnecessary pain to any man but study the happiness of all. Ground not your dignity upon your power to hurt others. Second side. Take counsel before you commence any measure, 
and never trust its execution to the inexperienced. Sacrifice your property for your life, and your life for your religion. Spend your time in establishing a good name, and if you desire fortune, learn contentment. Third side. Grieve not for that which is broken, stolen, burnt, or lost. Never give orders in another man's house, and accustom yourself to eat your bread at your own table. Make not yourself the captive of women. Fourth side. Take not a wife from a bad family, and seat not thyself with those who have no shame. Keep thyself at a distance from those who are incorrigible in bad habits, and hold no intercourse with that man who is insensible to kindness. Covet not the goods of others. Be guarded with monarchs, for they are like fire which blazeth but destroyeth. Be sensible to your own value. Estimate justly the worth of others and war not with those who are far above thee in fortune. Fifth side. Fear kings, women, and poets. Be envious of no man, and habituate not thyself to search after the faults of others. Make it a habit to be happy, and avoid being out of temper, or thy life will pass in misery. Respect and protect the females of thy family. Be not the slave of anger, and in thy contests always leave open the door of conciliation. Never let your expenses exceed your income. Plant a young tree, or you cannot expect to cut down an old one. Stretch your legs no further than the size of your carpet. The Caliph Harun ur Rashid was more pleased with the admirable maxims inscribed on this crown than with all the treasures he had found. Write these precepts, he exclaimed, in a book, that the faithful may eat of the fruit of wisdom. When he returned to Baghdad, he related to his favorite vizier, Jafir Bermenki, and his other chief officers, all that had passed, and the shade of Nushirwan was propitiated by the disgrace of Hussein ben Sahil, who had recommended despoiling his tomb and the exemplary punishment of the servant who had committed the sacrilegious act of taking the ring from the finger of the departed monarch. End of section 3section 4 of Folklore and Legends, Oriental. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Folklore and Legends Oriental by Charles John Tibbets. Section 4. Amin and the Ghoul. There is a dreadful place in Persia called the Valley of the Angel of Death. That terrific minister of God's wrath, according to tradition, has resting places upon the earth and his favorite abodes he is surrounded by ghouls horrid beings who when he takes away life feast upon the carcasses the natural shape of these monsters is terrible but they can assume those of animals such as cows or camels or whatever they choose often appearing to men as their relations or friends and then they do not only transform their shapes but their voices also are altered the frightful screams and yells which are often heard amid these dreaded ravines are changed for the softest and most melodious notes unwary travellers deluded by the appearance of friends or captivated by the forms and charmed by the music of these demons are allured from their path and after feasting for a few hours on every luxury, are consigned to destruction. The number of these ghouls has greatly decreased since the birth of the prophet, and they have no power to hurt those who pronounce his name in sincerity of faith. These creatures are the very lowest of the supernatural world, and besides being timid, are extremely stupid, and consequently often imposed upon by artful men the natives of isfan though not brave are the most crafty and acute people 
upon earth and often supply the want of courage by their address an inhabitant of that city was once compelled to travel alone at night through this dreadful valley he was a man of ready wit and fond of adventures and though no lion had great confidence in his cunning which had brought him through a hundred scrapes and perils that would have embarrassed or destroyed your simple man of valour this man whose name was amin beg had heard many stories of the ghouls of the valley of the angel of death and thought it likely he might meet one he prepared accordingly by putting an egg and a lump of salt in his pocket he had not gone far amidst the rocks when he heard a voice crying hula amin beg isfahani you are going the wrong road you will lose yourself come this way i am your friend karim beg i know your father old kerbella beg and on the street in which you were born amin knew well the power the ghouls had of assuming the shape of any person they choose and he also knew their skill as genealogists and their knowledge of towns as well as families he had therefore little doubt this was one of those creatures alluring him to destruction he however determined to encounter him and trust to his art for his escape stop my friend till i come near you was his reply when amin came close to the ghoul he said you are not my friend karim you are a lying demon but you are just the being i desired to meet i have tried my strength against all the men and all the beasts which exist in the natural world and i can find nothing that is a match for me i came therefore to this valley in the hope of encountering a ghoul that i might prove my prowess upon him the ghoul astonished at being addressed in this manner looked keenly at him and said son of adam you do not appear so strong appearances are deceitful replied amin but i will give you a proof of my strength there he said picking up a stone from a rivulet this contains a fluid try if you can so squeeze it that it will flow out the ghoul took the stone but after a short attempt returned it saying the thing is impossible quite easy said the isfahani taking the stone and placing it in the hand in which he had before put the egg look here and the astonished ghoul while he heard what he took for the breaking of the stone saw the liquid run from between amin's fingers and this apparently without any effort amin aided by the darkness placed the stone upon the ground while he picked up another of a darker hue this said he i can see contains salt as you will find if you can crumble it between your fingers but the ghoul looking at it confessed he had neither knowledge to discover its qualities nor strength to break it give it to me said his companion impatiently and having put it into the same hand with the piece of salt he instantly gave the latter all crushed to the ghoul who seeing it reduced to powder tasted it and remained in stupid astonishment at the skill and strength of this wonderful man neither was he without alarm lest his strength should be exerted against himself and he saw no safety in resorting to the shape of a beast for amin had warned him that if he commenced any such unfair dealing he would instantly slay him for ghouls though long-lived are not immortal under such circumstances he thought his best plan was to conciliate the friendship of his new companion till he found an opportunity of destroying him most wonderful man he said will you honour my abode with your presence it is quite at hand there you will find every refreshment and after a comfortable night's rest you can resume your journey i have no objection friend ghoul to accept your offer but mark me i am in the first place very passionate and must not be provoked by any expressions which are in the least disrespectful 
and in the second i am full of penetration and can see through your designs as clearly as i saw into that hard stone in which i discovered salt so take care you entertain none that are wicked or you shall suffer the ghoul declared that the ear of his guest should be pained by no expression to which it did not befit his dignity to listen and he swore by the head of his liege lord the angel of death that he would faithfully respect the rights of hospitality and friendship thus satisfied amin followed the ghoul through a number of crooked paths rugged cliffs and deep ravines till they came to a large cave which was dimly lighted here said the ghoul i dwell and here my friend will find all he can want for refreshment and repose so saying he led him to various apartments in which were hoarded every species of grain and all kinds of merchandise plundered from travellers who had been deluded to this den and of whose fate amin was too well informed by the bones over which he now and then stumbled and by the putrid smell produced by some half-consumed carcasses this will be sufficient for your supper i hope said the ghoul taking up a large bag of rice a man of your prowess must have a tolerable appetite true said amin but i ate a sheep and as much rice as you have there before i proceeded on my journey i am consequently not hungry but will take a little lest i offend your hospitality i must boil it for you said the demon you do not eat grain and meat raw as we do here is a kettle said he taking up one lying amongst the plundered property i will go and get wood for a fire while you fetch water with that pointing to a bag made of the hides of six oxen amin waited till he saw his host leave the cave for the wood and then with great difficulty he dragged the enormous bag to the bank of a dark stream which issued from the rocks at the other end of the cavern and after being visible for a few yards disappeared underground how shall i thought amin prevent my weakness being discovered this bag i could hardly manage when empty when full it would require twenty strong men to carry it what shall i do i shall certainly be eaten up by this cannibal ghoul who is now only kept in order by the impression of my great strength after some minutes reflection the isfahani thought of a scheme and began digging a small channel from the stream towards the place where his supper was preparing what are you doing vociferated the ghoul as he advanced towards him i send you for water to boil a little rice and you have been an hour about it cannot you fill the bag and bring it away well, certainly i can said amin if i were content after all your kindness to show my gratitude merely by feats of brute strength i could lift your stream if you had a bag large enough to hold it but here said he pointing to the channel he had begun here is the commencement of a work in which the mind of a man is employed to lessen the labour of his body this canal small as it may appear will carry a stream to the other end of the cave in which i will construct a dam that you can open and shut at pleasure and thereby save yourself infinite trouble in fetching water but pray let me alone till it is finished and he began to dig nonsense said the ghoul seizing the bag and filling it i will carry the water myself and i advise you to leave off your canal as you call it and follow me that you may eat your supper and go to sleep you may finish this fine work if you like to-morrow morning amin congratulated himself on this escape he was not slow in taking the advice of his host after having ate heartily of the supper that was prepared he went to repose on a bed made of the richest coverlets and pillows which were taken from one of the storerooms of plundered goods the ghoul whose bed was also in the cave had no sooner laid down than he fell into a sound sleep the anxiety of amin's mind prevented him from following his example he rose gently and having stuffed a long pillow into the middle of his bed to make it appear as if he was still there 
he retired to a concealed place in the cavern to watch the proceedings of the ghoul the latter awoke a short time before daylight and arising went without making any noise towards amin's bed where not observing the least stir he was satisfied that his guest was in a deep sleep so he took up one of his walking sticks which was in size like the trunk of a tree and struck a terrible blow at what he supposed to be amin's head he smiled not to hear a groan thinking he had deprived him of life but to make sure of his work he repeated the blow seven times he then returned to rest but had hardly settled himself to sleep when amin who had crept into the bed raised his head above the clothes and exclaimed friend ghoul what insect could it be that has disturbed me by its tapping i counted the flap of its little wings seven times on the coverlet these vermin are very annoying for though they cannot hurt a man they disturb his rest the ghoul's dismay on hearing amin speak at all was great but that was increased to perfect fright when he heard him describe seven blows any one of which would have felled an elephant as seven flaps of an insect's wing there was no safety he thought near so wonderful a man and he soon afterwards arose and fled from the cave leaving the isfahani its sole master when amin found his host gone he was at no loss to conjecture the cause and immediately began to survey the treasures with which he was surrounded and to contrive means for removing them to his home after examining the contents of the cave and arming himself with a matchlock which had belonged to some victim of the ghoul he proceeded to survey the road he had however only gone a short distance when he saw the ghoul returning with a large club in his hand and accompanied by a fox amin's knowledge of the cunning animal instantly led him to suspect that it had undeceived his enemy but his presence of mind did not forsake him take that said he to the fox aiming a ball at him from his matchlock and shooting him through the head take that for your not performing my orders that brute said he promised to bring me seven ghouls that i might chain them and carry them to isfahan and here he has only brought you who are already my slave so saying he advanced toward the ghoul but the latter had already taken to flight and by the aid of his club bounded so rapidly over rocks and precipices that he was soon out of sight amin having well marked the path from the cavern to the road went to the nearest town and hired camels and mules to remove the property he had acquired after making restitution to all who remained alive to prove their goods he became from what was unclaimed a man of wealth all of which was owing to that wit and art which ever overcome brute strength and courage end of section four section five of folklore and legends oriental this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by fadna jahangi folklore and legends oriental by charles john tibbets the relations of cd kur glorified angasuna garbi thou art radiant within and without the holy vessel of sublimity the fathomer of concealed thoughts the sanctum of instructors i bow before thee what wonderful adventures fell to the lot of nangasuna and to the peaceful wandering chan and how instructive and learned this city will be found all this is developed in thirteen pleasing narratives and i will first relate the origin of these days in the central kingdom of india there once lived seven brothers who were magicians and one baron a measure of distance further dwelt two brothers who were sons of a chan now the eldest of these sons of the chan betook himself to the magicians that he might learn their art but although he had studied under them for seven years 
Yet the magicians taught him not the true key to magic. And once upon a time it happened that the youngest brother, going to bring food to the elder, peeped through the opening of the door and obtained the key to magic. Thereupon, without delivering to the elder the food which he had brought for him, he returned home to the palace. Then said the younger son of the Chan to his brother, that we have learned magic, let us keep to ourselves. We have in the stable a beautiful horse. Take this horse and ride not with him near the dwelling place of the magicians, but sell the horse in their country and bring back merchandise. And when he had said this, he changed himself into a horse. But the elder son of the Chan heeded not the words of his brother, but said unto himself, Full seven years have I studied magic, and as yet have learnt nothing. Where then has my young brother found so beautiful a horse, and how can I refuse to ride thereon? With these words he mounted by the horse, being impelled by the power of magic, was not to be restrained, galloped away to the dwelling place of the magicians, and could not be got from that door. Well, then I will sell the horse to the magicians. Thus thinking to himself, the elder called out to the magicians, Saw ye ever a horse like unto this? My younger brother it was who found him. At these words the magicians communed with one another. This is a magic horse. If magic grows at all common, there will be no wonderful art remaining. Let us therefore take this horse and slay him. The magicians paid the price demanded for the horse, and tied him in a stall, and that he might not escape out of their hands. They fastened him, ready for a slaughter, by the head, by the tail, and by the feet. Ah, thought the horse to himself, my elder brother hearken not unto me, and therefore am I fallen into such hands. What form shall I assume? While the horse was thus considering, he saw a fish swim by him in the water, and immediately he changed himself into a fish. But the seven magicians became seven herons, and pursued the fish and were on the point of catching it when it looked up and beheld the dough in the sky, and thereupon transformed itself into a dove. The seven magicians now became seven hawks, and followed the dove over mountains and rivers, and would certainly have seized upon it. But the dove, flying eastward to the peaceful cave in the rock Gulumchi, concealed itself in the bosom of Nangasuna Bakchi, the instructor. Then the seven hawks became seven beggars, and drew nigh unto the rock Gulamchi. What made this import? Bethought the Bakchi to himself, that this dove has fled hither pursued by seven hawks? Thus thinking, the Bakchi said, Wherefore a dove flies thou hither in such alarm? Then the dove related to him the cause of his flight, and spake afterwards, as follows. At the entrance to the rock Gulumchi stand seven beggars, and they will come to the Bakchi and say, We pray thee, give us the rosary of the Bakchi. Then will I transform myself into the bomba of the rosary. Let the Bakchi then vouchsafe to take this bomba into his mouth and to cast the rosary from him. Hereupon the seven beggars drew nigh, and the Bakchi took the first bead into his mouth, and the rest he cast from him. The beads which were cast away then became worms, and the seven beggars became fowls and ate of the worms. Then the Bakchi let the first bead fall from his mouth, and thereupon the first bead was transformed into a man with a sword in his hand. When the seven fowls were slain and became human horses, the Bakchi was troubled in his soul, and said these words, Through my having preserved one single man have seven been slain, of a verity that is not good. To these words the other replied, I am the son of a chance, since therefore through the preservation of my life several others have lost their lives. I will to cleanse me from my sins, and also to reward the Bakchi, execute whatsoever he shall command me. The Bakchi replied thereto, Now then, in the cold forest of death, there abides C.D. Kur. The upper part of his body is decked with gold, the lower is of brass. His head is covered with silver, seize him and hold him fast. Whosoever finds this wonderful C.D. Kur, him will I make for a thousand years a man upon the earth. Thus spake he, and the youth thereupon began these words. The way which I must take, the food which I require, the means which I must employ, all these vouchsafe to make known unto me. To this the Bakchi replied, I shall be as thou demandest. At the distance of a barren, a measure of distance, from this place you will come to a gloomy forest, through which you will find there runs only one narrow path. 
The place is full of spirits. When thou reachest the spirits, they will throng around you. Then cry ye with a loud voice, Spirits, chulu chulu suchi. And when thou hast spoken these words, they will all be scattered like rain. When thou hast proceeded a little further, you will encounter a crowd of other spirits. Then cry ye, Spirits, chulu chulu suchi. And a little further on you will behold a crowd of child spirits. Say unto these, child spirits, Rira Padra. In the middle of this wood sits Sidi Kur beside an amiri tree. When he beholds you, he will climb up it. And But you must take the moon axe. With furious gestures draw nigh unto the tree and bid Sidi Kur descend. To bring him away you will require this sack, which would hold a hundred men. To bind him fast his hundred fathoms of checkered rope will serve you. This inexhaustible cake will furnish thee with provender for thy journey. When thou hast got thy load upon thy back, wander then on without speaking until thou art returned home again. Thy name is Son of the Chan. And since thou hast reached the peaceful rock Galumchi, thou shalt be called the peaceful wandering Son of the Chan. Thus spake the Bakchi and showed him the way of expiation. When Sidi Kur beheld his pursuer, he speedily climbed up the Amiri tree. But the son of the Chan drew nigh unto the foot of the tree and spake with threatening words. My Bakchi is Nangasuna Garbi. Mine axe is called the White Moon, and an inexhaustible cake is my provender. This sack, capable of holding a hundred men, will serve to carry thee away. These hundred fathoms of rope will serve to bind thee fast. I myself am the peaceful wandering son of the Chan. Descend, or I will hew down the tree. Then spake Sidi Kur, Do not hew down the tree, I will descend from it. And when he had descended, the son of the Chan thrust him into the sack, tied the sack fast with the rope, ate up the butter cake, and wandered forth many days with his burden. At length Sidi Kur said to the son of the Chan, Since your long journey is wearisome unto us, I will tell a story unto you, or do you relate one unto me? The son of the Chan kept on his way, however, without speaking a word, and Sidi began afresh. If thou wilt tell a story, nod your head to me. If I shall relate one, then do you shake your head. But because the son of the Chan shook his head from side to side without uttering a word, Sidi began the following tale. End of section 5 Recording by Fano Jangi Section 6 of Folklore and Legends, Oriental. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Folklore and Legends, Oriental, by Charles John Tibbets. The Adventures of the Rich Youth. In former times there lived, in a great kingdom, a rich youth, a calculator, a mechanic, a painter, a physician, and a smith, and they all departed from their parents and went forth into a foreign land. When they at length arrived at the mouth of a great river, they planted, every one of them, a tree of life, and each of them, following one of the sources of the river, set forth to seek their fortunes. Here, they said to one another, here we will meet again. Should, however, any one of us be missing, and his tree of life be withered, we will search for him in the place whither he went to. Thus they agreed, and separated one from another. And the rich youth found at the source of the stream which he had followed a pleasure garden with a house, in the entrance to which were seated an old man and an old woman. "'Good youth!' exclaimed they both. "'Whence comest thou? Whither goest thou?' The youth replied, "'I come from a distant country, and am going to seek my fortune.' And the old couple said unto him, "'It is well thou hast come hither. We have a daughter.' slender of shape and pleasant of behavior take her and be a son unto us and when they had so spoken the daughter made her appearance and when the youth beheld her he thought unto himself it is well i left my father and my mother this maiden is more beauteous than a daughter of the tangari godlike spirits of the male and female sex i will take the maiden and dwell here and the maiden said youth it is well that thou earnest here thereupon they conversed together went together into the house, and lived peaceably and happily. 
now over the same country there reigned a mighty chan and once in the springtime when his servants went forth together to bathe they found near the mouth of the river in the water a pair of costly earrings which belonged to the wife of the rich youth because therefore these jewels were so wondrously beautiful they carried them to the chan who being greatly surprised thereat said unto his servants dwells there at the source of the river a woman such as these belong to go and bring her unto me the servants went accordingly and beheld the woman and were amazed at the sight this woman they said to one another what would never tire of beholding but to the woman they said arise and draw nigh with us unto the chan hereupon the rich youth conducted his wife to the presence of the chan but the chan when he beheld her exclaimed this maiden is tangari compared with her my wives are but ugly thus spake he and he was so smitten with love for her that he would not let her depart from his house but as she remained true and faithful to the rich youth the chan said unto his servants remove this rich youth instantly out of my sight at these commands the servants went forth taking with them the rich youth whom they led to the water where they laid him in a pit by the side of the stream covered him with a huge fragment of the rock and thus slew him at length it happened that the other wanderers returned from all sides each to his tree of life and when the rich youth was missed and they saw that his tree of life was withered they sought him up the source of the river which he had followed but found him not hereupon the reckoner discovered by his calculations that the rich youth was lying dead under a piece of the rock but as they could by no means remove the stone the smith took his hammer smote the stone and drew out the body the physician mixed a life-inspiring draught gave some to the dead youth and so restored him to life they now demanded of him whom they had recalled to life in what manner wert thou slain he accordingly related unto them the circumstances and they communed with one another saying let us snatch this extraordinary beautiful woman from the chan thereupon the mechanic constructed a wooden garrison or wonderful bird which when moved upwards from within ascended into the air when moved downwards descended into the earth when moved sideways flew sideways accordingly when this was done they painted it with different colors so that it was pleasant to behold then the rich youth seated himself within the wooden bird flew through the air and hovered over the roof of the royal mansion and the chan and his servants were astonished at the form of the bird and said a bird like unto this we never before saw or heard of and to his wife the chan said go ye to the roof of the palace and offer food of different kinds unto this strange bird when she went up to offer food the bird descended and the rich youth opened the door which was in the bird then said the wife of the chan full of joy i had never hoped or thought to have seen thee again yet now i have found thee once more this has been accomplished by this wonderful bird after the youth had related to her all that had happened he said unto her thou art now the wife of the chan but your heart now yearns unto me step thou into this wooden garrison and we will fly hence through the air and for the future no care no more after these words the wife said to the first husband to whom destiny united me i am inclined more than ever having thus spoken they entered into the wooden garrison and ascended into the sky the chan beheld this and said because i sent thee up that thou mightest feed this beautiful bird thou hast betaken thyself to the skies then spake he full of anger and threw himself weeping on the ground the rich youth now turned the peg in the bird downwards and descended upon the earth close to his companions and when he stepped forth out of the bird his companions asked him hast thou thoroughly accomplished all that thou didst desire thereupon his wife also stepped forward and all who beheld her became in love with her you my companions said the rich youth have brought help unto me you have awakened me from death you have afforded me the means of once more finding my wife do not i beseech you rob me of my charmer once again thus spake he and the calculator began with these words had i not discovered by my calculation where thou wert lying thou wouldst never have recovered thy wife in vain said the smith where the calculations have been had i not drawn thee out of the rock by means of the shattered rock it was that you obtained your wife then your wife belongs to me a body said the physician was drawn from the shattered rock that this body was restored to life and recovered his former wife it was my skill accomplished it i therefore should take the wife but for the wooden bird said the mechanic no one ever would have reached the wife a numerous host attended upon the chan 
no one can approach the house where he resides through my wooden bird alone was the wife recovered let me then take her the wife said the painter would never have carried food to a wooden bird therefore it was only through my skill in painting that she was recovered i therefore claim her and when they had thus spoken they drew their knives and slew one another alas poor woman exclaimed the son of the chan and Sidi said ruler of destiny thou hast spoken words sarwala miss brog jack sung thus spake he and burst from the sack through the air thus Sidi's first tale treated of the adventures of the rich youth end of section six Section 7 of Folklore and Legends Oriental. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fano Jahangiri. Folklore and Legends Oriental by Charles John Tibbets. The Adventures of the Beggar's Son. When the son of the Chan arrived as before as the cold forest of the death, he exclaimed with threatening gestures at the foot of the Amiri tree, Thou dead one, descend or I will hew down the tree. Sidi descended, the son of Chan placed him in the sack, bound the sack fast with a rope, ate of his provender, and journeyed forth with his burden. Then spake the dead one these words. Since we have a long journey before us, do you relate a pleasant story by the way, or I will do so? But the son of the Chan merely shook his head without speaking a word, whereupon Sidi commenced the following tale. A long time ago, there was a mighty Chan who was ruler over a country full of marketplaces. At the source of the river, which ran through it, there was an immense marsh, and in this marsh there dwelt two crocodile frogs, who would not allow the water to run out of the marsh, and because there came no water over their fields, every year did both the good and the bad have cause to mourn, until such times as a man had been given to the frogs for the pests to devour. And at length the lot fell upon the Chan himself to be offering to there. A needful as he was to the welfare of the kingdom, denial availed him not. Therefore father and son communed sorrowfully together, saying, Which of us two shall go? I am an old man, said the father, and shall leave no one to lament me. I will go, therefore do not remain here, my son, and reign according as it is appointed. O Tangri, exclaimed the son, verily this is not as it should be. Thou hast brought me up with care. O my father, if the Chan and the wife of the Chan remain, what need is there of their sons? I then will go and be as a feast for the frogs. Thus spake he, and the people walked sorrowfully round about him, and then betook themselves back again. Now the son of the Chan had for his companion the son of a poor man, and he went to him and said, Walk ye according to the will of your parents, and remain at home in peace and safety. I am going for the good of the kingdom to serve as a sacrifice to the frogs. At these words the son of the poor man said, Weeping and lamenting, From my youth, Abba Chan, thou hast carefully fostered me. I will go with thee and share thy fate. Then they both arose and went unto the frogs, and on the verge of the marsh they heard the yellow frog and the blue frog conversing with one another, and the frog said, if the son of the Chan and his companion did but know that if they only smote off our heads with the sword, and the son of the Chan consumed me, the yellow frog and the son of the poor man consumed thee, the blue frog, they would both cast out from their mouth gold and brass, then would the country be no longer compelled to find food for frogs. Now, because of the son of the Chan understood all sorts of languages, he comprehended the discourse of the frogs, and he and his companions smote the heads of the frogs with their swords, and when they had devoured the frogs, they threw out from their mouths golden brass at their heart's pleasure. Then said the wanderers, The frogs are both slain, the course of the waters will be hemmed in no more. Let us then turn back unto our own country. But the son of the Chan agreed not to this, and said, Let us not turn back into our own country, lest they say they are become spirits. Therefore, it is better that we journey further. As they thereupon were walking over a mountain, they came to a tavern in which dwelt two women, beautiful to behold, mother and daughter. Then said they, We would buy a strong liquor that we might drink. The women replied, What have ye to give in exchange for strong liquor? 
Thereupon each of them threw forth gold and brass, and the women found pleasure therein, admitted them into their dwelling, gave them liquor in abundance, until they became stupid and slept, took from them what they had, and then turned them out of doors. Now when they awoke, the son of the Chan and his companion traveled along the river, and arrived in a wood, where they found some children quarreling one with another. Wherefore, inquired they, do you thus dispute? We have, said the children, found a cap in this wood, and everyone desires to possess it. Of what use is the cap? The cap has this wonderful property, that whosoever places it on his head can be seen neither by the tangari, nor by man, nor by the chatkars, evil spirits. Now go all of ye to the end of the forest and run hither, and I will in the meanwhile keep the cap and give it to the first of you who reaches me. Thus spake the son of Shishan, and the children ran, but they found not the cap, for it was upon the head of the Chan. Even now it was here, said they, and now it is gone. And after they had sought for it, but without finding it, they went away weeping. And the son of the Chan and his companion traveled onwards, and at last they came to the forest in which they found a body of Chatkars quarreling one with another. And they said, Wherefore did ye thus quarrel one with another? I, exclaimed each of them, have made myself master of these boots. Of what use are these boots? inquired the son of the Chan. He who wears these boots, replied the Chatkars, is conveyed to any country wherein he wishes himself. Now, answered the son of the Chan, go all of you that way, and he who first runs hither shall obtain the boots. And the Chatkars, when they heard these words, ran as they were told, but the son of the Chan had concealed the boots in the bosom of his companion, who had the cap upon his head, and the Chatkars saw the boots no more. They sought them in vain, and went their way. And when they were gone, the prince and his companion drew on each of them one of the boots, and they wished themselves near the place of election in a Chan's kingdom. They wished their journey, laid themselves down to sleep, and on their awakening in the morning, they found themselves in the hollow of a tree, right in the center of the imperial place of election. It was, moreover, a day for the assembling of the people to throw a bailing, a sacred figure of dough or paste, under the guidance of Tangeri, upon whose head even the bailing fails. He shall be your chan. Thus it spake they as they threw it up, but the tree caught the bailing of destiny. What means this? exclaimed they all with one accord. Shall we have a tree for our chan? Let us examine, cried they one to another, whether the tree concealed any stranger, and when they approached the tree, the son of the Chan and his companion stepped forth, but the people stood yet in doubt, and said one to another doth, Whosoever ruleth over the people of this land, this shall be decided tomorrow morning by what proceedeth from their mouth. And when they had thus spoken, they all took their departure. On the following morning, some drank water, and what they threw from their mouth was white. Others ate grass, and what they threw from their mouth was green. In short, one threw one thing, and another another thing. But because the son of the Chan and his companion cast out from their mouth golden brass, the people cried, Let the one be Chan of this people, let the other be his minister. Thus were they nominated Chan and minister, and the daughters of the former Chan was appointed the wife of the new Chan. Now, in the neighborhood of the palace wherein the Chan dwelt, was a lofty building, whither the wife of the Chan betook herself every day. Wherefore, thought the minister, does the wife of the Chan betake herself to this spot every day? Thus thinking, he placed a wonderful cap upon his head, and followed the Chan's wife through the open doors, up one step after another, up to the roof. Here the wife of the Chan gathered together silken coverlets and pillows, made ready various drinks, and delicate meats, and but for their perfume, tapers, and frankincense. The minister, being concealed by his cap, which made him invisible, seated himself by the side of the Chan's wife, and looked around on every side. Shortly afterwards, a beautiful bird swept through the sky. The wife of the Chan received it with fragrance, giving tapers. The bird seated itself upon the roof, and twittered with a pleasing voice. But out of the bird came Solangu, the son of the Tangeri, whose beauty was incomparable. And he laid himself on the silken coverlets and fed the dainties prepared for him. Then spake the son of the Tangeri, 
thou hast possessed this morning with a husband whom thy fate has allotted to thee. What thinkest thou of him? The wife of the Jan answered, I know too little of the prince to speak of his good qualities or his defects. Thus passed the day, and the wife of the Jan returned home again. On the following day, the minister followed the wife of the Jan as he had done before, and heard the son of the Tangri say unto her, Tomorrow I will come like a bird of paradise to see thine husband. And the wife of the Chan said, Be it so. The day passed over, and the minister said to the Chan, In yonder palace lives Salandu, the beauteous son of the Tangari. The minister then related all that he had witnessed, and said, Tomorrow early the son of the Tangari will seek thee disguised like a bird of paradise. I will seize the bird by the tail and cast him into the fire, but you must smite him in pieces with a sword. On the following morning, the Chan and the wife of the Chan were seated together when the son of the Tangari, transformed into a bird of paradise, appeared before them on the steps that led to the palace. The wife of the Chan greeted the bird with looks expressive of pleasure, but the minister, who had on his invisible making cap, seized the bird suddenly by the tail and cast him into the fire. And the Chan smote at him violently with his sword, but the wife of the Chan seized the hand of her husband, so that only the wings of the birds were scourged. Alas, poor bird, exclaimed the wife of the Chan, as half dead, it made despair as well as it could through the air. On the next morning, the wife of the Chan went as usual to the lofty building, and this time, too, did the minister follow her. She collected together, as usual, the silken pillows, but waited longer than she was wont, and sat watching with staring eyes. At length, the bird approached with a very slow flight, and came down from the bed house covered with blood and wounds, and the wife of the Chan wept at the sight. Weep not, said the son of the Tangri. Thine husband has a heavy hand. The fire has so scorched me that I can never come more. Thus spoke he, and the wife of the Chan replied, Do not say so, but come as you are wont to do. At least come on the day of the full moon. Then the son of the Tangri flew up to the sky again, and the wife of the Chan began from that time to love her husband with her whole heart. Then the minister placed his wonderful cap upon his head, and drawing near to Pagoda, he saw through the crevice of the door a man who spread out the figure of an ass, rolled himself over and over upon the figure, thereupon took upon himself the form of an ass, and ran up and down, braying like one. Then he began rolling afresh, and appeared in his human form. At last he folded up the paper, and placed it in the hand of a birchen, a Kalmuk idol. And when the man came out, the minister went in, procured the paper, and remembering it the ill treatment which he had formerly received, he went to the mother and daughter who had sold him the strong liquor, and said, with crafty words, I am come to you to reward you for your good deeds. With these words, he gave the women the three pieces of gold, and the women asked him, saying, Thou art indeed an honest man, but where did you procure so much gold? Then the minister answered, by merely rolling backwards and forward over the paper did I procure this gold. On hearing these words, the women said, Grant us that we too may roll upon it. And they did so, and were changed into asses. And the minister brought the asses to the Chan, and the Chan said, Let them be employed in carrying stones and earth. Thus spake he, and for three years were these two asses compelled to carry stones and earth, and their backs were sore wounded and covered with bruises. Then saw the Chan their eyes filled with tears, and he said to the minister, Torment the poor Bruce no longer. Thereupon they rolled upon the paper, and after they had done so, they were changed to two shriveled women. Poor creatures, exclaimed the son of the Chan, Sidi replied, Ruler of destiny, though, has spoken words. Swarwala misstood Jagzank. Thus spoke he, and flew out of the sack through the air. And see this second relation treats of the adventures of the poor man's son. End of section 7 Recording by Fano Jahangiri Section 8 of Folklore and Legends Oriental This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends, Oriental, by Charles John Tibbets. The Adventures of Masang 
When the son of the Chan arrived at the foot of the Amiri tree, and spoke as he had formerly done, Sasidi approached him, suffering himself to be placed in the sack, fastened with the rope, and carried away. Sasidi spoke as before, but the son of the Chan shook his head, whereupon Sasidi began as follows. A long time ago there lived in a certain country a poor man, who had nothing in the world but one cow, and because there was no chance of the cow's calving he was sore grieved, and said, if my cow does not have a calf, I shall have no more milk, and I must then die of hunger and thirst. But when a certain number of moons had passed, instead of the calf the poor man had looked for, he found a man with horns, and with a long tail like a cow. At the sight of this monster the owner of the beast was filled with vexation, and he lifted up his staff to kill him. But the horned man said, Kill me not, father, and your mercy shall be rewarded and with these words he retreated into the depth of a forest, and there he found among the trees a man of sable hue. "'Who art thou?' inquired Masong the horned. "'I was born of the forest,' was the reply, and am called Idar. "'I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest.' And they journeyed forth together, and at last they reached the thickly covered grassy plain, and there they beheld a green man. "'Who art thou?' they inquired. I was born of the grass, replied the green man, and will bear thee company. Thereupon they all three journeyed forth together until they came to a sedgy marsh, and there they found a white man. Who art thou? inquired they. I was born of the sedges, replied the white man, and will bear thee company. Thereupon they all four journeyed forth together until they reached a desert country, where in the very depths of the mountain they found a hut, and because they found plenty both to eat and to drink in the hut they abode there. Every day three of them went out hunting and left the fourth in charge of the hut. On the first day, Idar, the son of the forest, remained in the hut and was busied preparing milk and cooking meat for his companions, when a little old woman put up the ladder and came in at the door. "'Who's there?' exclaimed Idar, and upon looking round he beheld an old woman about a span high, who carried on her back a little sack. "'Oh, what, there is somebody sitting there,' said the old woman, "'and you are cooking meat.' Let me, I beseech you, taste a little milk and a little meat. And though she merely tasted a little of each, the whole of the food disappeared. When the old woman thereupon took her departure, the son of the forest was ashamed that the food had disappeared, and he arose and looked out of the hut. And as he chanced to perceive two hooves of a horse, he made with them a number of horses' footmarks round the dwelling, and shot an arrow into the court. And when the hunters returned home and inquired of him, Where is the milk? and the fatted meat. He answered them, saying, There came a hundred horsemen, who pressed their way into the house, and took the milk and the flesh, and they have beaten me almost to death. Go ye out and look around. And his companions went out when they heard these words, looked around, saw the prints of the horse's feet, and the arrow which he himself had shot, and said, The words which he spoke are true. On the following day the son of the grass remained at home in the hut, and it befell him as it had befallen his companion on the previous day. But because he perceived the feet of two bullocks, he made with them the marks of the feet of many bullocks around the dwelling, and said to his companions, There came a hundred people with laden bullocks, and robbed me of the food I had prepared for you. Thus spake he falsely. On the third day the son of the sedges remained at home in the hut, and because he met with no better fortune, he made with a couple of the feet of a mule a number of prints of mules' feet around the dwelling, and said to his companions, A hundred men with laden mules surrounded the house, and robbed me of the food I had prepared for you. Thus he spake falsely. On the following day Masong remained at home in the hut, and as he was sitting preparing milk and flesh for his companions, the little old woman stepped in as before, and said, Oh, so there is somebody here this time. Let me, I pray you, taste a little of the milk and a little of the meat. At these words Masong considered, Of a certainty this old woman has been here before. If I do what she requires of me, how do I know that there will be any left? And having thus considered, he said to the old woman, Old woman, before thou tastest food, fetch me some water. Thus spoke he, giving her a bucket of which the bottom was drilled full of holes to fetch water in. When the old woman was gone, Masong looked after her, and found that the span-high old woman, reaching now up to the skies, drew a bucket full of water again and again, but that none of the water remained in it. While she was thus occupied, Masong peeped into the little sack which she carried on her shoulders, and took out of it a coil of rope, 
an iron hammer, and a pair of iron pincers, and put in their place some very rotten cords, a wooden hammer, and wooden pincers. He had scarcely done so before the old woman returned, saying, I cannot draw water in your bucket. If you will not give me a little of your food to taste, let us try our strength against each other. Then the old woman drew forth the coil of rotten cords and bound Masong with them, but Masong put forth his strength and burst the cords asunder. But when Masong had bound the old woman with her own coil, and deprived her of all power of motion, she said unto him, Herein thou hast gotten the victory. Now let us pinch each other with the pincers. Whereupon Masong nipped hold of a piece of the old woman's flesh as big as one's head, and tore it forcibly from her. Indeed, youth, cried the old woman, sighing, but thou hast gotten a hand of stone. Now let us hammer away at each other. So saying, she smote Masong with the wooden hammer on his breast, but the hammer flew from the handle, and Masong was left without a wound. Then drew Masong the iron hammer out of the fire, and smote the old woman with it in such wise that she fled from the hut, crying and wounded. Shortly after this the three companions returned home and said to Masong, Now, Masong, thou hast surely had something to suffer. But Masong replied, Ye are all cowardly fellows, and have uttered lies. I have paid off the old woman. Arise, and let us follow her. At these words they arose, followed her by the traces of her blood, and at length reached a gloomy pit in a rock. At the bottom of this pit there were ten double circular pillars, and on the ground lay the corpse of the old woman among gold, brass, and armor, and other costly things. Will you three descend, said Masong, and then pack together the costly things, and I will draw them up, or I will pack them, and you shall draw them out. But the three companions said, We will not go down into the cavern, for of a verity the old woman is a shumnu, a witch. But Masong, without being dispirited, allowed himself to be let down into the cavern and collected the valuables which were then drawn forth by his companions. Then his companions spoke with one another, saying, If we draw forth Masong, he will surely take all these treasures to himself. It were better then that we should carry away these treasures and leave Masong behind in the cavern. When Masong noticed that his three companions treated him thus ungratefully, he looked about the cavern in search of food, but between the pillars he found nothing but some pieces of bark. Thereupon Masong planted the bark in the earth, nourished it as best he might, and said, If I am a true Masong, then from this bark let there grow forth three great trees. If I am not, then shall I die here in this pit. After these enchanting words he laid himself down, but from his having come in contact with the course of the old woman, he slept for many years. When he awoke he found three great trees which reached to the mouth of the pit. Joyfully clambered he up, and betook himself to the hut which was in the neighborhood. But because there was no longer any one to be found therein, he took his iron bow and his arrows, and set forth in search of his companions. These had built themselves houses and taken wives. Where are your husbands? inquired Masong of their wives. Our husbands are gone to the chase, replied they. Then Masong took arrow and bow and set forth. His companions were returning from the chase with venison, and when they beheld Masong with arrow and bow, they cried as with one accord, Thou art the well-skilled one. Take thou our wives and property, and we will now wander forth thither. At these words Masong said, Your behavior was certainly not what it should have been but I am going to reward my father. Live on, therefore, as before. By the way, Masong discovered a brook, and out of the brook arose a beautiful maiden. The maiden went her way, and flowers arose out of her footsteps. Masong followed the maiden until he arrived in heaven, and when he was come there, Chumusta Tangari, the protector of the earth, said unto him, It is well that thou art come hither, Masong. We have daily to fight with the host of Shumnu, which is, Tomorrow look around, after tomorrow be companion unto us. On the following day, when the white hosts were sore pressed by the black, Chermusta spoke unto Masong. The white hosts are the host of the Tangari, the black are the host of the Shumnu. Today the Tangari will be pressed by the Shumnu. Draw therefore thy bow and send an arrow into the eye of the leader of the black host. Then Masong aimed at the eye of the leader of the black host and smote him so that he fled with a mighty cry. Then spake Chermusta to Masong, Thy deed is deserving of reward. Henceforward dwell with us forever. But Masong replied, I go to reward my father. Hereupon Chermusta presented to Masong Dishindamni, 
the wonderstone of the gods, and said to him, By a narrow circuitous path you will reach the cave of the Shumnu. Go without fear or trembling therein. Knock at the door and say, I am the human physician. They will then lead thee to the Shumnu Chan, that you may draw out the arrow from his eyes, then lay hands upon the arrow, scatter seven sorts of grain towards heaven, and drive the arrow yet deeper into his head. Thus spake Trumusta authoritatively, and Masong obeyed his commands, reaching without erring the cavern of the Shumnu, and knocked at the door. What hast thou learned? inquired the woman. I am a physician, answered Masong, and he was conducted into the building. He examined the wound of the Chan, and laid hands upon the arrow. Already, said the Chan, my wound feels better. But Masong suddenly drove the arrow further into the head, scattered the seven grains towards heaven, and a chain fell clattering from heaven down to earth. But while Masong was preparing to lay hands upon the chain, the Shumnu woman smote him with an iron hammer with such force, that from the blow there sprang forth seven stars. Then, said the son of the Chan, he was not able to reward his father. Ruler of destiny, thou hast spoken words. Sasarwala, misdud, jonkzang. Thus spank Sisidi and burst from the sack through the air. Thus Sisidi's third relation treats of the adventures of Masong. End of section 8. Recording by Philip Gould.